Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. We're headed into game two between Edward Gaming and AHQ Esports Club. And Zyrene, Coro in the top lane there for EDG was a big part of this win. So how is AHU going to attack that matchup? Well, first, you don't let Ziv die level one, level two. You also put him in a matchup where he's going to have a little better time because Koro, they left the Hecarim, they left the Nara unbanned, and they banned out Pawn's Azir and his LeBlanc, which I thought was very questionable. And now that they're swapping sides, EDG, you know, if you're going to take away one of those top laners like Hecarim or Nara on AHQ side, you have to ban the other one. You really just can't let Koro have one of those champions because he's just going to carry really hard. I think for the game, I felt like EDG could have just steamrolled out of the level one. You know, getting such a huge lead on Hecarim. And in a way, they did just kind of crush AHQ, but they let them farm a lot. Wester had a lot of damage, and they did get beat in the bottom lane as well. Yeah, that bottom lane was actually impressive. The Civil Leona combo, walking into it as a Callista, especially with a Hurricane build, which it needs a lot of ramp up damage, is just a very risky. And they actually made them pay for it. So credit to AHQ's bottom mm -hmm. lane. They might be able to make something work in this series. All right, you mentioned, I want to go back to the top lane real quickly, just because statistically in the top lane for AHQ, they've played three NAR games and now three Maokai games. So Hecarim not even making an appearance for them. So it would, uh, you know, kind of go with your point there that they throw the Hecarim ban out, take the NAR as a more threatening top laner. Yeah, I definitely agree with something along those lines because they just can't let him have that Hecarim. It's banned against him all the time in LPL. I think we talked about how Fizz would have been the better pick. And one of the things that I really like about Fizz with the Sejuani is that Sejuani is a champion that usually forces a mid laner to take the cleanse. The problem is that Twisted Fate is also a champion that gets stopped by cleanse, so it's really beneficial for Pawn to have taken that. If it was against a Fizz, the only thing he can cleanse is the Ignite, making that matchup really hard for him. So I want to see them just switch up the mid lane and jungle synergy to make the, make it a hard time for Pawn. All right, well, we're only one game in, and it's been an exciting series already as we shoot it to the casters for game two. We'll hear from EDG's Mako, who thinks the chance to adapt makes the semifinals five game series a whole nother animal. Uh, 感觉就是很很有一些令人不可思议发生的一些东西，然后BO5的话就输一局的话，后面调整好心态的话，应该就会都都能赢的。well, I don't think fixing the mentality after that game will be too hard. They're not going to throw a ban at Nautilus just because it went crazy. <laughs> yeah, I can still go to support, but I think there's some more important picks and bans that are going to be going through the second game. Yeah, HQ now on the blue side, of course. They banned LeBlanc and Azir in the last game. It's not really champions west or play, so if they're so afraid of them, they should ban them once again. And then I would ban out the Hecarim against Coral. He was so strong on the other side for EDG. Continue banning Mountain. Rexar, Gragas, remove them or make it so yeah. that if they first pick it, right. you get two super strong picks on the side of EDG because he didn't have any early impact. We heard the analyst desk saying a few picks. Coulda, woulda, shoulda. We'll see if any of those fall through here in the second game. Azir will be banned. Kalista is one that they will put an eye on on the side of EDG. Yeah, one thing I do want to keep in mind as well is what happens to this mid lane match. To me, it's actually one of the most important matchups in terms of who wins this game. We saw Edward Gaming have complete control over Dragons and Objectives because Pawn won that matchup so hard. And now he gets to counter pick being on the red side here. And I think he can really punish Westor in this one. You're seeing AHQ banning away team fighters. The Hecarim ban coming okay. in as well, which means that they actually want to push Koro down. They've got to take away Nar. And there's the red side. So if. Age who wants to first pick Gragas. I don't, right I don't think they need to. That's, I mean, that's obviously what EDG wants to try and say here. If you want to put him on Gragas, which is one of the other good early game junglers we have seen Mountain use back in the LMS where he can have an impact early on, then it would leave the Nar open for Koro, even Maokai if, if he wanted as a takeaway from Ziv. So there's definitely a decision to make here from AHQ. I also want to see if LeBlanc will be a thing, because it's been banned so often against EDG. AHQ banned it in the last game as well. So clearly, they were afraid of it, changing up the ban now. All right, it's going to push actually Koro down to... Wow, he actually goes for Maokai even though Nar was left available. Yeah. It's weird because Ziv's top two is this Maokai, but also the Nar, and then Koro's top two is the Hecarim and also the Nar, and he chooses to try to push Ziv around that a champion he's still comfortable on. I guess Maokai, he just feels is more important in this matchup all the same. So you get that Gragas, the early game jungler for Mountain, though. It's a big deal. Seems that a lot of players have been kind of going back to that Maokai 
But for sure, ultimates, you don't have to wait for a bar, maybe. Just a lot more when you need it, ready for the fight. Yeah, we really get to see AHQ and the value they put on Mountain in the jungle. With Absolutely. the Gragas first pick, giving over the Maokai to Edward Gaming, obviously. Thresh as well is going to be a big deal. Mako had a good game on it, on it before. He's had multiple good games on this champion. Mm -hmm. Also has an Annie, if needed. Yeah. Maybe he's, uh, maybe he's playing it later on. We're going to have to see. And they may even pick up Nautilus again. I mean, Elvis used to be in the jungle anyway, so that's just regular for him to do that last game. Pick up Nautilus. Nautilus still on the team. Why not? It's been back and forth before. Yeah, honestly, I think it's a really good choice for him. Of course, the one happy thing for Ever Gaming is they know they're going to get that clear left Sejuani whenever they want it. So there's really not a lot of steals left. Yep. It's going to be weird for H. You having a first pick, uh, or sorry, blind pick a mid laner. He usually goes for Cho'Gath, which has got sort of moderate impact on the game. That's very true. If they do want to play Cho'Gath, they're going to need something to help him as one well of these fights. So I would go Sivir here for and in this bottom lane. He played it before, and it simply helps them force some of these team fights around Dragon that they like to do. If they lock in Jenna, however, I think we might see a change over to Jinx from them, from AHQ. It's something they run as well, where it's so much just about protecting him. We're gonna have to see what the lock-ins will be. This can still be a severe, but he's now gonna be taken away. I think he should have locked it in instead of Gnar. You didn't have to take Gnar here, with Maokai already shown, and Sivir would have been so good to make sure you can play your style of forcing picks on EDG. I don't know. Yeah, I, I guess you're right. Picking up Sivir and making sure you have that style. But if you're talking about AHQ pivoting and then leaving the high impact champions, the high impact players of AHQ, the ones who carry the game, Westor and Anne, they have as much time as possible to choose exactly what type of champion they actually want to put into this game. If there's something in store for AHQ, letting these guys see most of the team comp and saying, yes, this is the AD carry mid laner we want for this game. I can see the, the, the merit of AHU waiting on these two picks. Def does get to steal away the Sivir. I love that champion of course. I think it's very strong. EDG have great team fight. Yeah, I just feel like when Kalista Urgot has been banned, passing on Sivir is, is a bad idea. Because she is such an important champion for both teams. Honestly, it was also going to be a takeaway from Def. So AHQ, what do they have left? Of playoff AD carries for Anne, it would have been the Jinx. But they swapped away from the Janna, which they most likely wouldn't have enjoyed having now, yeah. to have some disengage, because there's a lot of dive on for Edward Gaming here to get onto this Jinx. And there's nothing except for the Gragas ulti that's really going to push them away from it. We can maybe say the Gnar ulti as well. But then all of this is used very, very defensively. It's a style they've played, like to play, protect the AD carry. It's the kind of game I'd want to see Fizz in, actually. Just something to create so much havoc. But there you go. There you go. Ash. Wish granted. So, after we just talked about HQ could struggle protecting the AD carry. They do swap away from the Jinx. They want the Lucian instead. A lot more mobility to dash around. A lot more skirmish potential as well from him. And of course, as you said, good old Fizz from West Door. Good old Fizz it. indeed. We'll see how they can react to the team that looks like from EDG. Loves to fight and will fight with this composition coming in here. That Sivir picked up means they can always go forward. Pawn is yes. switching back and forth between this yeah. Cassidy, though. The one he came back in game five with to win it for EDG. Special for him when he came back against Absolutely. World Elite, obviously. Sick and everything, you played the first four games. <laughs> yep. Now, this is also very much an LPL pick. They love Cassidy over there into the fist. So with the flask start, we're not going to see... We're going to see two guys try and basically farm it out and rush to level six <laughs> right. before a whole lot is going to happen from it. And we're just going to have to see the early impact, the fist, 2v2 fights with a Karagas is going to be very strong for AHQ, so they're trying to change it up. Last game, they had the weaker mid lane in terms of the laning phase, and that really made them yeah. struggle around the early vision, around the Dragons. Now they have a good, good 2v2 skirmish where they can try and force some picks, especially once you hit level 6 on the Fizz. Yeah, I honestly think AHQ's comp looks a lot more like we've seen them win their games here in this tournament. A bunch of early game power. Mountain is back on a Gragas. We've yeah. seen Albus roam very well on Gragas, and if they break the flash off of Pawn early game, E HQ is so good at abusing Summoner spell cooldowns. But honestly, both teams here getting comps that really fit their style. Yeah. EDG, yeah. When I, whenever I watch them team fight, they're so good at getting to the back line. When you have a Cassidy who's going to build the Thieves, they're going to go crazy at that back line. They can get onto the AD carry, onto the mid laner every single time. So, and he's going to have to just run one way because he's going to get destroyed if he stays too far forward. 
Going to have to be very careful. That Sivir is what Deft got his Penta on to take them out of the LPL. And remember to keep hitting us up at LOL Esports with your series votes. Tweet hashtag AHQ win or hashtag EDG win. And we'll update the poll once we are in the game. And Raren with some kills on each side of the board. This is now AHQ. They said, Westor said himself, like Crumb said, the man doesn't stutter. It's going to be four games. They have their chance here. They saw the first pitch from EDG. We'll see if they can repair it. Uh, AHQ, if you want to make it four games, they're going to need three in a row. Either way, Edward Gaming come into game two with a one game lead after a very close and very fun game one, but full of great objective control by the Chinese team. Now AHQ coming to make their mark once again the signature fizz for west door i think it's going to be a whole bunch of fun to watch this game yeah so two assassins in the mid lane 280 carries with at least the early game being somewhat the same lucian needs to get a bf sword before he really starts taking over the, the lane against the saber can trade really really aggressively once you hit level six as well you just dash forward you just pop your ulti in your face and she can't really trade back with you so that can be tricky for Def in that matchup, but it's not one where he can just sit back and farm. And then instead, I mean, we keep talking about how Lucian, he's a champion that's good at everything, but not the best at anything. Like, he's good laning phase, he's good mid game, he's good late game. Yeah. He can be played as somewhat of a hyper carry if you're really, really good at using him. We're gonna have to see what Ann can do, because he's gonna be very important here. Both Cassidy and Fizz, great scaling, but if a Cassidy with a Thien's build go crazy in team fight, it's over. We'll have to see just who gets ahead because we see AHQ love getting an an early game lead and Lucian spikes pretty darn hard off of one or two items. So Athene's Cassidy might have to be very afraid of a high damage AD carry on the backside of this one. And just like game one, actually, both teams uh, with defensive or just sort of middle of the river wards. Right. Last time we saw something like this, EDG made much better choices in the sort of blind pick lane swap situation once again with no knowledge of where the enemy yeah. team is starting. We'll see what happens here. And they're doing it again. They know that AHQ likes to keep the duel in on the bottom side for the yeah. dragon control and they don't have as much experience lane swapping. So they're swapping once again to the top side, trying also to stop this early aggression coming in from Mountain, where he can just gank over and over. Mako doing exactly the same. Last time he invaded on the red buff, now he's going straight to the blue buff. He spots that, they, that EDG, or sorry, that AHQ was starting on the bottom side, and once again, Clear Love and Coral can now walk into this blue buff and join him. So let's see if HQ adapts. They have to go to the enemy blue buff now, where the water oh. just been placed to avoid walking into three guys like before. Sniped out by the turret right quick. Probably didn't take one of all that extra damage to himself, but they still have control of the top side of the map. Great plays here as well from Mountain, as he does not want to tussle with that at all. Gives himself the easy route. And just reporting out though, AHQ is actually getting experience here on Ziv. He's got Flash, he's Gnar in general. This should be fairly safe a good point. for Ziv to just get experience. This four-man jungle or three-man jungle from Edward Gaming, they're looking for a dive with this as they can maybe push in afterwards. It's the same setup again. You have your dual lane, or sorry, you have your jungle and, to and top laner on the side with the dual lane. So they are around once you push in the wave. And you obviously want to go now and deny Ziv everything. There's no help for him because Gragas is on the bottom side of the map. Yeah. Notice the ward here at the Dragon from EDG. That's very smart to spot who's moving there. They saw Mountain move up to the blue buff, so they know he's on the bottom side. And there's no chance for him helping. And that's why Nar also has to back away as soon as he feels there's someone coming. Otherwise, he would just end up dying. And these are very interesting choices by both teams. Ziv managed to absorb one level of XP from all this, and looks like he feels safe with the dive isn't happening once this wave gets cleared out, so he's absorbing a little bit more. But neither team pushing that hard to kill off the turrets. EDG going back. It's, it's interesting because every time Ziv shows, EDG wants to kill him, and Ziv just tooling them around the map as they're just going to go for a dragon. They're able to get a dragon. EDG doesn't really care about these very much. So both teams getting what they want in the early game. EDG just wanted to deny farm from Ziv while we had the Maokai to do our junglings with Clearlove on Sejuani and now he can return down. He just needs to put a sapling or a ward in the tri bush behind his tier 1 tower on the bottom lane and then Coral should be able to spot if HQ is moving in. EDG knows that HQ is fairly low now because they've just been taking this dragon here to take some damage for it. They had vision on them before so there's a low chance of your Maokai being towered off right now and that's why Coral can also return down. There's a sapling in the tri bush. He will spot Mountain and then he can 
walk away. Yeah, good luck diving in level 3 Maokai with uh, this low of health. Two bars. saplings. Really yeah. smart by Koro. He's going to be completely safe on this one. And Safety even, in numbers. Oh, absolutely. Good job by them. The buddy system saplings, they will still <laughs> die. Maybe even faster than normal. Valiantly. But at least they're going to you know, feel more friendly going into this one. Now, AHQ, while they got the dragon, Edward Gaming got a ton of damage on that top lane turret. And Ooh. it's actually going to be going down in the next few seconds as the next wave crashes and Ziv being here or not. So Edward Gaming get enough on this one to get the first turret kill of the game. And it's going to be a lot of money on the def, giving him a pretty quick BF sword. Quick night there. Mountain didn't really make a move, so the overall kill pressure here is down on Pawn if he decides to flash away from this situation. Oh! No, they're able to just zero him out as Mountain gives him a nice body slap. The only way to survive was if you flashed a body slam. That didn't happen because Mountain was like, body slam flash into your face. Yeah, exactly. Securing the kill, very important, goes over to Westor on this fist here. When you have two assassins, an early gank can often snowball it completely in favor of one member. In this case, the early kill, Westor also gets to go back and makes up for these 10 CS he's behind. Now Koro might be in trouble. The saplings, they've died. And he's now stuck on the tower. Nobody's left for him. Ignite comes in. Great. Dodges some of the CC, Ooh. but it's going to be nearly enough. Albus holds Zago for now. Walks away. Does die for his sins. And actually, oh. Dev, with the saving flash heal, keeps Koro alive. Dive does not succeed. And you've got a Sivir defending a turret valiantly. Look at the dodge from Koro here with his double. You're getting out of the hook from a Nautilus, dancing around them. And because he got so many levels from staying in that lane, got up to level 4 at least, it was very, very hard to dive him. And he misses practically nothing as he heads to the top lane here. Great place. Very nicely done to skill himself out of that situation. So once again, lane swap wise, EDG wins out. They get top tower, they get more farm on their top right. laner as well while keeping even on AD carries. The first one in mid lane, though, that's a different thing. It had nothing to do with the swap itself. And we're going to have to see if Westall can use it. As we said, he is falling slightly behind in CS. We'll get quite a bit under the tower here. And obviously, the Cassadin build we see now, it takes a bit of time before it starts really becoming effective. You go Rod of Ages, you build in a Codex, and you just sit there so you get the 10% cooldown reduction. You want to you wanna reach 30% by the time you hit level 11 and get ranked to ulti. So it's basically gets caught by one second in terms of the cooldown on it. And then you build your hourglass until you finish your Athenes as a third item. And that's where you really start becoming powerful. You get so much mana back when you get a kill on assist. It's a build that if the people who are watching the ULCS that I really love and talk way too much about, <laughs> I will not mention anything more until it is complete. A missed hook there. You can see the Ardent, day, or ardent Blaze being applied to keep that movement speed in for Anne. Unfortunately, it will have to wait again. Push control here, trying to be headed up by Mako, but they're not able to give too much until the junglers are going to get down here. Pretty much a skill matchup for these guys. Daft also quite low on mana here. So just trying to clear out this wave, but stay safe. You can see how they're getting scared a little bit. But this is a bottom lane that HQ can control pretty well. Yeah. Rush is one of these supports who use a lot of animations when he has to cast, so he's fairly easy to land a hook on from a Nautilus. If you see him charge up his own hook, he's obviously not going to move. And you connect it with him, your jungler joins in, and you get a fairly easy kill. So they can keep pushing it up. Thresh has to stay fairly far back. Let's see what happens in mid. Is this uh, a and repeat mid lane? Pawn 6 now. That's flash now, yeah. doesn't matter. There is, though, I want to point out, if AHQ knows about it, no flash or heal on depth. That is the lane I want to see AHQ abuse. They're likely to do so. You can see they're already fighting around this lane. They catch up on the Mako. Force him to flash away. The blue buff's going to be theirs as well. And the turret probably not far away. Clear love goes in anyway. They'll pops the CC. A ton of damage coming through. Mountain goes down to Mako overall. Albus on the way out. Double buff. The Thresh doing a lot of damage. And Def going to pick up a cleanup kill as well. A third casualty in. As Clear Love picks up Westor, what a turnaround by EDG. Yeah, it was AHQ who walked into the jungle of EDG to set up for this blue buff and completely backfires. EDG just collapsing on it. Let's see it again, exactly what happened. So AHQ trying to get a pick on Mako. This is a support, by the way, ulti used by oh. Westor. That's so important because so much of this damage comes from his ulti now with 20% damage increase as well. Ooh. And they just get caught together. EDG collapsing beautifully. Picking up some very important kills. Might get another one on Anne. Oh, very close. Is here. Dredge line just missing during that entire fight. Koro didn't have to move. Soaking up so much experience in the top lane. 50 to 22 in CS terms on that. And Deft now pushing this lane. Just easy. Cool, calm, cool, and collected with Mako on his back. 
Zeph's got some items to buy very soon. He's got to be sitting on plenty of gold, about 1,500 right now, actually. So a BF Sword recall going to be able to come through. And it's going to even be in time for this Dragon respawn. So Edward Gaming has got kind of all the tools they need right here. And we have now seen the same lane swap for EDG twice. Right. For the next game, HQ, if it comes in again, they have to adapt and say, OK, we cannot move our top lane to sit alone in the swap because we know four members are going to go in and just deny them all the farm. So either you just take them down on the bottom side and you just mirror what EDG is doing and you take a fast tower and just trade two towers with some jungle farm on your top lane and then you go back to standard lanes or you send up your support and jungle to help him so he doesn't get killed and they have to be there early so they don't simply deny them from getting to the tower. AHQ has to be able to adapt once we hit game three because they're now twice being set really far behind in terms of top laners in these swaps. Something we also watched or noticed in their games is when they do start taking towers, they'll prioritize pushing the lanes, but then it won't be the ideal way of pushing those lanes. They won't get anything out of the result or they'll just go for the camps instead of the turns. Yeah, AHQ's way of winning games tends to be very slow and very dragon focused, but that's not maybe going to happen as EDG's here first. So now they've taken butt tower for AHQ. Mid lane should be the focus where they sit that Cassid in with so little wave play for them. You can also go top lane against the Malcon, try and put real pressure on that and get at least the two side lanes, side turrets up. Right. But you gotta abuse the fact that Cassid has so low wave clear in these early stages here. You have Illusion to push in. They're gonna go top first, expect mid lane right after once right. the power is dead. Bit of a read here from EDG with that bottom turret falling. They know the pressure is probably gonna be top side. Yeah. So one in the other see how both teams play off of this. And then we're just going to have to see EDG react to it, take the bottom lane tower and trade two outer turrets, and then you put Death in the mid lane because you know the Lucian is swapping in there, so you keep your wave play AD carry with him, and then Kassadin has to just start finding farm in the side lanes. He has mobility to get away from ganks, so EDG should be able to read this. I like the fact they're trading the towers at first. But they can push even more. There is no one yeah. from HQ reacting, and Death is happy to keep pushing, and Wars Ann's like, oh, I'll freeze the wave, no big deal even though this wave is going to push in regardless, so a mistake here for AHQ, but bot lane tier 2 is dying right now. This is kind of that pushing the lanes ideally, gentlemen, we were just talking about. EDG is able to act on that way better. Two in a row here, and already the pressure has backed. AHQ is in response mode now. They actually, and stays in the top lane. They may get core out of this one. Just a few more shots to take him down, and it looks like EDG will start to back from their bottom lane fight here as they finally pick up that kill on the Koro. So they get one kill top lane, but yeah, two towers died in the bottom lane. That's very important. Makes it super easy for Deft to just go into this mid lane and start defending against the Lucian, the push that you know is going to come from AHQ once he's getting a bit of fun maybe in the top lane and another kill, potentially. You don't want to feed this caster oh, in. Oh. <laughs> His build does take time, but Worth. once he hits the three items, he becomes an absolute monster. Time's ticking faster for EDG. Yeah. It's getting even better as Pawn's already got a kill and two assists. He's scaling up nicely despite being first blooded. And look at Deft here now. He's realizing you cannot take the farm top. You have to go mid lane. We see Lucian show up. So both teams know how to push the advantage now. And then Deft realizes there's a red buff as well because they just cleared the wave mid. So he will get something, but he will get in the mid lane. Don't worry. That's a lot of self control to leave that wave there as a set. <laughs> as we're pointing out as we get into this point in the game, though, Dragon just died a couple minutes ago. Most of the outer turrets are already gone but it's only 13 minutes into the game. The actual ability to tower dive is actually quite low at this stage. Mm -hmm. Normally you see top laners who freeze get punished because you dive the mid laner, stuff gets really crazy. You see West Door in kind of a weird spot, but in this case, both top laners actually are freezing, trying just to scale on Ooh. up. A great dodge by West Door, but now actually a fight may just start. Clearly going to get hit up. The shark comes through, or is it Irv? And more stuns still coming through. Ziv really wants to do something, forcing the Q over the wall, but a re-engage by Westor hops away from the play. Koro in the front line goes in onto Albus. This Nautilus taking plenty of punishment. And where is Daft? Where is Pawn? They're joining now the fight. EDG could be re-engaging and picking up some kills. Ziv looks like he could back in with Nard. Mids the wall up, and they do take down Mako. Now onto Westor. Koro is actually low, though. That Nard ultimate just shoves everybody up towards the top side of the fight and repositions AHQ to be be able to turn around. Oh. Death, can he clean it? Actually, Han gets out of vision. Now he's got to turn towards Mountain. Is there enough to get over a wall and dodge out on Deft? The ward is there. It's one last boomerang. You better duck in Han's, or in Mountain's. Oh, he's so no. now with the barrel slow. Oh. Oh. He had to suck in for that one. <laughs> He's okay, unless Cora decides. Okay. Oh, what? Okay, let's see. Home guard. Home guard. Flying through, that's a fast tree. I don't think he's gonna be cutting anything down on this one though. Quickly slowed down 
and shut down on the home guard speed. We're really learning how greedy Koro can be. <laughs> Teleporting him for that one. Chasing Mountain, he stays alive. Now it is Midtow taking a lot of damage from Death. Might see more fights. Oh, oh, almost predicting the Lantern. Man, so many near kills in all these fights. Really fun battle to watch. And HQ came out of that last fight. Of, oh, nice Q. Came out of that last fight up one kill, actually. I didn't think it was going to go so well for them, but they did claw their way back in a little bit. All that said, though, 2,000 gold lead for Edward Gaming, and we can watch that incredibly close fight one more time. So let's see, Philov is now out of the fight. If you look at the minimap, Castellan and Sivir are coming in, but they're coming fairly late. So HQ is staying five players together at the moment, just trying to find targets. EDG decides to re-engage just when Meganar pops for Ziv. Westar goes back in, get a good stun and a good ulti later on. So it's looking okay for HQ, but now the damage dealers start joining. Death is coming down the bottom of your screen here as well, and will try and at least get some kills. And in the very end, Mountain, so quite an escape. <laughs> Make sure HQ gets out alive. Well, he gets out alive. Woo! And he's drinking while doing it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He's trying to be responsible, though. He got out alive. It's like drunken boxing. You just got to swerve a whole lot, and they never know where you're going. That's right. 16 minutes into this one, Mountain seems to be one of the first out of the gate after that big fight. And the replay, he is able to grab a little bit of control here. There's going to be a minute on to Dragon. So far, one to one to each team, but they have their eyes set on number three. And a better showing in the early game for Mountain this game here on the Graga. Still not able to really gank a whole lot, simply because of the Elaine Troll coming in from EDG. Had that very good dive in the mid lane, though, for the first blood. And he's definitely been pulling his weight on the Graga. I like that. Yeah. It's very impressive. <laughs> We'll see what West Orc can now do. He is in a bit of split push mode for the team. That means they're going to have to be kind of relaxing a little bit on these engages. Hopefully, Koro doesn't get in their face too hard as he's been trying to. He's to the top side to clear. Both teams are kind of just waiting it out here until we get the spawn of the Dragon. Looks like West Orc has already backed and will be in place. And last call for recalls. Right. We can see the setup we talked about where you keep Deft in the mid lane to have the wave play. You put the Cassidy in the side lane instead. He can sit there and farm all he needs, and now you got to worry about this drag control in terms of the vision in there. There are a few green walls being placed by HQ, and only one ping, so none of the teams really committing too hard to it yet, but you can see everyone is moving to the area. Who gets out the control first, and we're going to have another bloody team fight. I don't think EDG can sweep all the wards where the AHQ has. Meanwhile, I think, unless these sight stones come back down, Edward Gaming doesn't have a whole lot of vision over this area. As the recalls come in, though, they do have plenty of charges. We're going to see just how Edward Gaming plays this fight. I think they are the team with the control. Malkai pushing down the mid lane. Cassidy pushing down the bot lane. They're still all grouped up on this side of the river, protecting the pink ward that's so important for them. HQ do not have any deep vision in this one. Not on the river, at least. That's the on the hunt. Looks like they're not going to be able to get in too much range over the wall. Doesn't give us too many options to the rest of the team. Pong can still make it over. They're getting under their own turret now. EDG gets bounced back. A great explosive cast from Mountain. Oh! And the follow-up is there from Han. Piercing light through the entire team. Mountain chugs. The passive can't keep him alive. And it is a one-for-one one in a quick fight. The Dragon is still alive. Westar is not done yet. He's going back in. And the Shark comes in, but he's exhausted all the same. Not a lot of damage coming through. Force to jump back up, but Sif goes in. Goes for the Mega Koro tries to limp away from this one. Look at but Han is getting time to hit. Oh. He's going to pick up two. And Pod still can't find anyone to deal any real damage to. Finally chunks out and You've now got to be careful of this blue buff. Cassidy. House has come at him, but he's staying alive. And nobody want to back away here between these two teams. They just keep diving onto each other. HQ lost two members. Yet three guys are like, no, we're not done here. We can pick up a few kills. And was left untouched. Three kills now. This Lucian. Nobody started the dragon. It's about defending a pink ward, and if you dare touch it, we will fight. <laughs> That's one of the parts I love. If there's no other reasons on the map to fight, putting a ward down is going to make the reason for you. Let's see this again. We said if it wasn't Westroar to carry fights, it would be Ann, and throughout this, he got a triple. So EDG has a lot of ways to engage, and they see Westroar on the bottom side. That's why they go for it here. Get some good kills early on. Death, though. Getting knocked back into the tower will end up dying. This is very important that he goes down because there's a lot of the damage for EDG gone now. So despite them getting two kills, AHQ with also Meganar coming off, feel like they can still go for the fight. And will get a few kills from Let's see what happens. So Westor 
Doesn't get to do a whole lot, but N. Nobody's jumping him. All the CC has now been used. Mako is almost out of mana as well. And with the Meganar. And Ann just staying in the back. He gets two kills for himself. And guys, there's more fights. And it's going to be a fight that Edward Gaming might not like. Pot has to jump over the wall for this one. AHQ happy to re-engage. Nice hook over the wall. Mountain getting caught out. But Zap getting hit up by Westor. Goes down to the passive. And now two. more kills come through with Playful Trickster. Mako point blank calling. A third kill comes in. One traded back by Koro. But now he's all alone. Pawns left him. He's left Koro to die by himself. The tree falls alone to the forest. But AHQ is there to listen to it happen. And it's so crazy watching these fights here. Both teams just keep jumping in and going for them. And when you run comms, that kind of does the same. Winning mid-game fights are so good for you because you snowball even harder because you know how EDG wants to win the game. It's the exact same thing for you, but if you're just that much stronger from better items yeah. and more gold, how is EDG going to win? And I hope we get a quick replay on that one too because Pawn took the lantern, the guy that could rift over the wall, and left Deft on the other side by himself. He miffed the wrist lock. <laughs> he like face checked a wall and was like, oh God, God, let me get out of this one. And then Deft was sad. But Oh, he's like, that All was right. my lantern. And also, nobody's far enough ahead yet for us to say it's really snowballing. Uh, I think the gold is equal towards right now, anyone. So. It's dead even. Let's see what happens. Let's see how close this was, actually. Westar jumps in. It's quite some damage, and then we smack into the wall if we had a cast it in. We leave our AD carry out there. <laughs> He's on his own now. Death goes down, meaning once again, HQ can win the fight because they take down one of the damage dealers. When we have all these tank comps here, getting to that back line is so, so important in the current meta. And because the face, well, the face plan that gets into the wall, <laughs> Dead's left and Coral. Oh, it is never ending right now. What a brutal game. AHQ seems to be already engaging on EDG, or EDG the other way around, double turret dive, and they are regretting it now. They've already lost Coro. They've already lost Pawn, and now they have to run out as AHQ stands five tall. Let's see what they can get off of this one. AHQ traditionally just keeps capitalizing on Dragons more than anything else. I want to see how relentless they can actually be in terms of pursuing objectives after these team fights. 26 kills this game in 22 minutes, and AHQ still stand at only two turrets taken down. They'll steal away a blue buff. That seems pretty safe. But as far as deep wards, not many down and not many turrets well, pressured either. When do you even have time to deep ward in this match here? Every time <laughs> we have a replay, we come out, there's another team fight going on. So none of the teams That's because really somebody warded. Sure, but, <laughs> but they were deep. You're right. They were deep. None, none of the teams really been able to set up anything other than just an engage on each other. So it's going to be a lot about also the side lanes here, because if you can set them up before a fight starts, it makes it very hard for the other team, despite winning it, possibly pushing down anything, because you got all these minions they have to deal with. We're going to have to see if that's going to be important for either of the teams later on. The Kassadin is slowly but surely getting to his three items. The cooldown reduction is now sitting on around the 30% mark. So yeah, you caught a whole second off your ulti yeah. at rank two. And that's important because you will get four, five, six jumps very quickly. Absolutely crazy so far. 15 to 11, 23 minutes into the game. Deficio, you may have to start jumping in on some of these fights with me and Free. <laughs> it's just getting wild right now. Four to two in turrets and EDG. The momentum of game one does not seem to be flying through for them as AHQ still keeps this game quite even. Great yeah. job by Ann so far. 4-0, 8, 192 out of the lane. I mean, this is AHQ getting to play their kind of game. They got the 80 carry ahead. He's yeah. actually held a minion lead over Def pretty much the entire game. The Lucian counterpick, if you will, working very well in the matchup. Westor got to go make plays all the time. Unsurprising yeah. here. Ziv's actually on a self-sufficient top laner, and though he's losing the matchup, he's still able to create some kind of pressure. But Mountain now getting cut out here. Pretty hard to miss a champion Ooh. that big, especially with a name that big. And he's going to try to run away. <laughs> a great explosive cast. Going to buy some time, but in comes Koro. He's going to find Ann, but the rest of the team still goes for Mountain. But that's still going to be the shutdown. AD carry falls, and Alp is going to be maybe the next one to drop. Yes, it is. Pawn doing so much work. Now catching up towards Mount Ziv, is still alive. is alive but low, he's maybe a hill at this point. And EDG, with plenty alive, could push down another turret. Slowly keeping this one alive, but I don't know for how long. There's Koro, the one to dive in again and prompt the fight for the rest of the team. Tanking it as Pawn, and he'll be able to go in and out safely. Ow. Clear love, swinging the flail, brings it down on West Door's head. Make sure the door doesn't hit him on the way out. And that was such a big mistake for Mountain and AHQ. They just split up in all the side lanes here. Westall was down, pushing one lane. We had 
Ziv on Nara and the other one without teleport. And then you randomly walk around the river all on your own. EDG, catch him, punish him, get a team fight where HQ is completely split up and sudden, suddenly pick up some kills for themselves. I feel like yeah. these fights here just keep going back and forth. It's all about who's being caught out of position because their teams are so even. One mistake can cost yeah. you everything. Back and forth is the best word you can use. 15 to 15 right now. But pretty much enough back and forth. 30 kills in just 25 minutes. Exactly what we expected from these two teams. They are absolutely hungry for objectives. And the only way to get it is if the other team is off the map. Well, speaking of being off the map, there's two big timers I want to point out. Dragon's All up right. in a minute. And Ziv has TP while Koro does not for another three and a half. That's the thing I think ASU can absolutely abuse. Ziv has had a hard time with the 1v1, but if you're on the, on the other side of the map, it's good regardless in fighting for Dragon number four in this game. There's an inherent advantage for AHQ because of this global teleport pressure that they've got. Let's see if they can get to use it. Megana has been pop frame. He's in the top and trying to push it in. So he will at least try and control the side lanes. We talked about it before, how important it is to always see if you can deny minions and get some damage on the enemy towers by just starting a, a slow push with your minions and then you have this big team fight. Even if you lose it, you might force them back to Ooh. clear the minions. We're gonna see another engage, by the way. It's coming now. But all oh. pops on, hits on, and Pa's gonna follow up and down he goes! AHQ once again are moving too far forward on the map when they're trying to push every single lane at once. You are against so much mobility from EDG to just get onto you every single time. And now Mountain is being caught out. Wow, why is even in the mid lane right now? That's going to be a quick pickup. Jumps over the wall, but nope. a great hook for style points. Pawn, 6, 3, and 9. He's got the most kills in the game. Something changed for AHQ. It just started breaking up the power and numbers roll. And they have been picked off now, one after the other. Baron for EDG. This is going to be a very hard contest for AHQ. Don't have really enough to He's get in. Coming. Help is trying. Ziv is going to gnaw out just now. He locks down Clear Love. Baron actually has about 1,500 HP. Nobody can really keep fighting for it, but they're trying to push everybody. So Baron is attacking them. Pod picks up a double. Then it's going to be Clear Love as he gets the Baron. Beautiful fight and just in and out by EDG on that one. Yeah, AHQ really feel like they're taking a little bit too relaxed when they're just walking around the map and being caught out now a few times. EDG. Get that band, we know they will go instantly for it. They don't care yeah. about the dragons. If you lose a fight in the late game, Baron is gone. And AHQ just don't know when to say no. Time and again, we see them say, but but, but you're going for Baron or Dragon. We must fight right. you here for this one. Sometimes it works, but frequently it does not. No cross map objectives taken for when EDG goes for a fight. Paul, oh, good, goodbye. Oh, look at his build. He had enough oh. gold to go back and get another large rod for himself. He's getting really, really fed. Nine kills now. Ten kills in the last game. And had just come back up. We see Mountain down as well. EDG taking full control here of game two. AHQ still going to try their damnedest with every fight and to keep fighting to keep themselves in this one. We see Second Dragon being picked up now by AHQ. They tie those up. Still four to three in turrets here. We'll see where their pressure goes. Koro. Strong again, trying to be aggressive in the mid lane. And every really hitting late game here for the mid laners, we're gonna see the difference. This is so much about landing his ulti and blowing up one target. The Castellan can keep yeah. jumping onto your AD carry over and over and over. He's gonna have such a low cooldown. Two seconds base with also 30% cooldown reduction for him at rank three when he hits level 16. And then you have that Athene's giving, is it like 40% mana back or 30% mana back? You have your Nether Blade and everything. You get so much mana back when you get a kill or an assist. So EDG can just keep jumping on your back line. Fizz won't be able to do the same. That's going to be a big difference. And here we go, Ever Gaming. They're great at playing alongside Baron Nasher buff. And look at this a hook on Albus goes Ooh. down. Mago gets the kill because he wants one too. Koro, where else would he be? Inside the enemy ranks, and they're just pushing AHQ around. Inhibitor gonna go down 29 minutes in, but more kills, why not? Ziv hooked up and killed, a stun on him out, and he's gonna have to retreat as well. HQ on the back foot, Edward Gaming looking to push in to win this game, to start the series out 0-2, a re-engage comes in, I don't know if it's gonna be enough, 
because Pawn is crushing everybody. A shutdown does come through, but I think Westor has to go back and was out on the hook. Mako gets his second kill of the fight. 3, 4, and 19 for him. Koro on the fountain, not of his own will, but he might still survive the fight all the same. EDG. It's going to take him some time. The real a lot of durability from Mako there. Taking one down on the fountain. It took a while for EDG to find a crack in AHQ's armor. Once they did, they went from 15 to 27 kills and Baron immediately. And then on to the Nexus. EDG take game two over AHQ. Talked about how when we have two comps that does the same. If you stop making some mistakes, it's just going to snowball so heavily in the other right. direction. EDG completely punished AHQ for... Honestly, randomly being caught out on the map. And then the Baron was everything they needed to finish it. And Pawn on cast, and his name may be Pawn, but this game he was king. 25 kills and assists of the 27 that his team had overall. He was absolutely everywhere. Got first blooded in a snowball assassin matchup, and yet found ways to crush all throughout the game. Hey man, since the days of old, the Pawn has been the only one that can bring your team back into the game. <laughs> and he does it here once again. It just seems like nothing can stop him once he gets a few kills on his Cassidy. And 10, 3, and 15 is the score he records yeah. here in Game 2. We are really seeing AHQ play into the play style of EDG. What they like to do is have these fights over and over and over. They're a team fighting team. They do it really well. If you make a mistake, you get punished. And that's what happened now in two games in a row. Also, this lane swap, as we talked about in the game, it has to be fixed. You cannot keep falling behind to the same strategy from EDG in the lane swaps. Yeah, you got punished, as you see there. <laughs> no, please. You couldn't hold that, could nope. you? For more on EDG's second win here, we're going to send it over to our guys on the analyst desk. Thank you, gentlemen. 2-0 now for EDG, but it's not like these games are not close. We're seeing AHQ hang in in the gold, take some fights, but the coordination does not seem to be there that at any moment they're taking a breath and strategically taking control of the game. I mean, they don't seem close up until a certain point and then it's just completely over as to how we thought EDG played one fight. They take the game from you and that's what they're doing here. AHQ needs to compose themselves a little bit. They take a lot of fights on and on and try to match EDG and at times they win because that's kind of how they play as well. But they're not even looking at the map. They're taking fights where in Westor is split pushing bottoms like, oh, oh, let's fight, let's fight. Oh, Westor wasn't here. Whoops. Yeah, that's a typical 4-1 split push from AHQ that gets punished. So EDG definitely did their homework coming into this. And then their lane swaps too. They're over committing on top side from AHQ. And then the turret goes down. EDG gets an advantage there. They swap it back. EDG is just playing it a lot better. The over commit is what I want to hit on because we talk about both these teams being fight heavy. I think that the difference is, is that AHQ overcommit a little bit more from EDG. I am not saying that EDG don't overcommit <laughs> because they definitely do, but AHQ just seem to want to ride that last little bit of the fight a little bit too far and then it turns around and bites them. Yeah, and also, uh, you know, to the Picks and Bands point, we were talking about the top lane and how much that might matter here. We saw some, you know, some pretty sweet outplays by Koro in the tower dives early on, but that Hecarim ban came through. AHQ prioritized the NAR, but it didn't seem to quite make the difference that they needed coming into this game. Yeah, Koro's still effective on Maokai is the thing. And then Pawn, you know, we talked about him being pretty much the fourth carry. He's like the backup carry of the team. <laughs> when Koro's on some type of tanky top laner, Pawn really has the opportunity to step up and be that carry for his team. And he did it on the Cassidy. It was a very volatile matchup in the mid. And the scariest thing is that's not even where Cassidy's really strong. He wasn't level 16. Yeah. He didn't have his Grail. He didn't have a Lich Bane. There was going to be a point in that game where anytime Anne went near anything, all you do is sit in a brush. You stack up as we see them going through some more strats, probably thinking how many riff walks can we stack in a brush there? <laughs> Because all you do is you stack it up, then you flash Rift Walk W the AD carry, and they die. I have a feeling deft after that. It's like, come on, man, make your Rift Walks work. Let me have the lanterns <laughs> no. after oh, having to oh, run away there. He had flash during that little moment. I don't know why he didn't just flash over the top of the wall and then just join his team. Instead, he runs around, and then he blows his flash at the end to die to the Fizz Sea Stone Trident. And that's the interesting thing, though, about these high-octane games is that we do start to see these high-level players make mechanical errors or small judgment errors in their split-second decision-making, and it really is about instincts. 
mistakes and which of these teams is going to capitalize on those minor mistakes from the other. With so many team fights, that's exactly what happens. And AHQ just need to compose themselves and slow the game down for them. They really need to look at the bigger picture and see what's happening when they commit for a kill, what's happening when EDG makes a move. Look at the weaker side of the map. And they, it looked good in the early game, to be honest. That tower dive against Korra was a good idea, but failed execution turns the whole game around. Off that, they probably could have been able to snowball a little bit, but at this rate, I don't even trust them to be able to take that lead and close out against EDG. Now for AHQ, I do have to point out Anne in that game, doing a lot of work on Lucian. When we look at just DPS in those fights, positioning pretty well, but again, you know, sometimes getting lost in, you know, the mix, eing in, getting caught out yeah, by the Cassidy. Yeah, the Cassidy's going to catch him pretty much no matter what. And the game was 29 minutes long. If Cassidy hits level 16, it's even worse. Protecting on Anne basically becomes impossible. He's going to reach him, and you just have to deal with the Kastanen once he does, and, and that's the situation. I want to hit on that, because that's actually the rest of AHQ's fault. Twice now they've ran anti-carries against their AD, uh, AD carries, and they've done absolutely nothing to shut the, shut the heck room or now the Kastanen down. Mm -hmm. These are two champions that are both punishable during the laning phase, and Anne needs the rest of his team to win those lanes so he can do his job. If he, they don't do their job, he's not going to be able to do anything. All right, so then you point to the mid lane there specifically for this matchup with the Kastanen West door on Fizz not making as much of uh, an impact in terms of pressure in that lane early on or is that Mountain not paying attention you know to that lane and, and putting pressure there? I think it was fine for him to be honest. Um, we are expecting him to fall behind a little bit in CS not as much as it, as it happened but towards the mid game his team fighting was perfectly fine. What I want to look at is the lane swaps that happen. At this point, there's going to be a lot of mind games for AHQ. They want the lanes. They have strived in an environment where you can camp the 2v2, but they haven't gotten it. The lane swaps have really shafted them over. So perhaps go for a blind lane swap. You know, you go for a five point defense and then you just blind lane swap. It's very difficult to scout. EDG would have to invade heavily and commit to a lot of wars to one side of the map and you can still pull off a blind swap. They need to get the 2v2. If they don't, I think they're just gonna get blown out of the water. Yeah, because twice EDG's got the first turret, got the, I guess, first successful play, then made a play on the other side of the map straight away to shut down exactly what AHU were doing. The point that I was trying to make is that Kassanen shouldn't have his turret up in that game and it was never really under pressure. So I just don't think they committed heavily enough to the strategy of getting it into the mid lane and shutting it down. So we're looking at some composure coming through for AHQ, as you mentioned, as we look forward to this next game, though, Zyrene, on the side of EDG. How do they close this out in a clean 3-0? They just keep doing what they're doing. They get the lane swap. They make sure that they have their jungler clear love pretty much in the same spot as always. Like, basically, just stick to the formula. Pick an anti-carry to shut down the carry of the enemy team, whether it's a top laner, whether it's a mid laner, and just snowball it. They are taking these fights, and they just have mechanical execution two notches better than AHQ, and that's what they're relying on right now, and it's working. And I love it. It's a clean 3-0, because no one is ever going to call these games well, clean. Well, when I say clean 3-0, just meaning they don't drop a yeah, game, right? I know what uh, Yeah, it, well, I mean, I would have the argued the same clean point is that you need to clean up your execution and your mechanics here for EDG, because as we mentioned, across the board seem to be one notch up in all of the positions, so as long, you know, both teams could be doing the same thing as long as you're executing slightly better. Of course, you'll come out on top. So composure for AHQ but composure only when they're up there with these guys in terms of gold. We saw it at that 30K mark here in this game. They were even, but when they're down 5K, how do they get back into it? Well, they keep fighting. They have to focus on turrets. And we saw at one point at the second dragon, we thought, okay, give up the second dragon. You have the first one, go for the top tower, get the lane swap, and then defend your tier two bottom. But some sort of brain fart happened to them and then they gave up their tier two bottom when they clearly saw that EDG was rotating into that. They really need to prioritize in denying the gold for EDG. When you get the, the only dragons that matter are number one, number three in certain compositions, and the fifth one. Like you can give up tier two, the second dragon to get an influx of gold. They really need to prioritize because they're not farming as hard as they should be and they're falling behind in items because of it. Yeah, and the other thing I want to point out is that EDG right now are showing absolutely nothing. So you might be thinking that they're heading into these games very messy, but they don't have to show anything else. If they can win another messy game, plays right into their hand. We haven't seen Jinx, we haven't seen Nunu. Yep. They have heaps more tricks left. All right, well, we're going to step away while the team prepare for game three between Edward Gaming and AHQ Esports Club. Keep it tuned right here. We'll be back in just a second.
They saw the first pitch from EDG. We'll see if they can repair it. And the Shark comes in, but he's exhausted all the same. Not a lot of damage coming through. Force to jump back out, but Sif goes in. Goes for the Mega Narcoro. Tries to limp away from this one. Getting hit up by Westar. Goes down to the passive. And now Ooh. more kills come through with Playful Trickster. Mako point blank calling. Baron actually has about 1,500 HP. Nobody can really keep fighting for it, but they're trying to push everybody, so Baron is attacking them. To start the series out, 0 and 2. Ooh. A re-engage <laughs> comes in. I don't know if it's going to be enough, because Pawn is crushing everybody. EDG take game two over AHQ.